All right. Adam Rittenberg, ESPN, has done a great job covering this Northwestern fallout. Um, Adam, this has obviously been a whirlwind, um, stunning few days for Northwestern football and Northwestern athletics. What's this been like to cover? Yeah, it's been interesting, Jeremy. I was on vacation, you know, when the initial um, report came out with the two week suspension for Pat Fitzgerald. I, I wrote a news story before I played a round of golf out in California, and I, I kind of thought that was it. That was my mistake. Uh, certainly, you're probably not paying enough attention to the fact that they did corroborate some of the claims in that uh, hazing investigation. And then certainly everything changed on Saturday with the additional report from the Daily Northwestern and other things that were coming out on Saturday into Sunday and certainly speaking with the former player who really initiated all of this, as far as the investigation, you knew this was a, uh, a situation that wasn't going to go away. Uh, and certainly the president coming out with the letter that he was going to reassess discipline on Saturday. Um, it became a, obviously a huge story. Uh, Monday and Tuesday were one of the two of the longer days I've had in my career, but um, here we are. And again, still a lot of unanswered questions. No one has spoken publicly about this. Uh, as far as Northwestern officials go. Um, and so there's still a lot to sort out, even though uh, the Pat Fitzgerald era stunningly is is over after 17 years. Yeah, it's amazing. Adam, I, I had some experience, and, and I guess this is why we go to journalism school, is is for stories like this, right? Um, and, and when the Simon Sianovich story broke, like there, there's covering it, um, you have to approach it a, a certain way. So how do you approach it when you have, and I thought in your story, like, you presented everything there and some people might not like that you present everything is there. Like, how do you go about your job when something like this happens when you got some people saying this, some people saying this, and you just don't have access to everything in that report or what the school knows. Right. Well, I, I did think it was important after the um, details came out in the, in the daily Northwestern to try to contact the whistleblower. Um, I, I through some sourcing, I, you had a pretty good idea about who he was. Uh, you know, reached out and he very much wanted to to talk um, and continue to get his story out there. Uh, you know, there's obviously other sides of it. There is obviously this, the side uh, that supports Pat Fitzgerald, which remains sizable and, and vocal to it to a degree. Whether it's current players, former players, people around the program. Um, and, and so I needed to reach out to them, too. And, you know, certainly there was a current player who had you know, pertinent information, who had spoken to this uh, whistleblower and you know, could kind of shed light on his motivations. But here's the thing, Jeremy, and there've been a lot of people that have raised some red flags, honestly, about the, the whistleblower and his credibility, but it doesn't matter if the, if the, if the allegations check out. And that's essentially yeah. what they did in the, in the investigation. And that was maybe part of it that, that I, I admittedly didn't pay enough attention to or give enough credence to. I think we can say now Northwestern certainly did not give enough credence to that. Um, and the possibility that if if further details came out about this or other people speaking out about this, um, it could become a much bigger deal than they initially thought it would be on Friday. So um, that was the that was the ambition here was just to be as fair as possible and comprehensive as possible. But um, but obviously give the whistleblower, you know, some some uh, a platform in addition to say what he needed to say, but also push back against some of the things that uh, people w w weren't corroborating um, that, that obviously generated some headlines. Yeah. Um, ultimately, Adam, wh why was there such a discrepancy in Northwestern going from a two week suspension to firing the most impactful person in its football programs, modern history? Yeah, it, it's a question I've been asked a lot. And, and again, without talking with president chill, uh, other than reading his letter, it's, it's hard to, to, to formulate the best answer to that. Um, but I think what happened, a couple of things happened. Certainly details getting out, media and public backlash was a factor. W whether they want to say so or not, it was absolutely a factor. Um, the president did make contact with the whistleblower's family on Friday, he says. Um, so he learned of the whistleblower's identity seemingly after the investigation concluded and then began to learn more personal details about what happened. So it became more personal for the university president. Um, then there was additional uh, things that came out, people either corroborating hazing or uh, alleging you know, racial mistreatment. Um, and these things are fairly common, not to not to um, you know, minimize them at all. But like when somebody comes out and says something, usually others follow, uh, even though in some cases these things allegedly hadn't happened for, you know, 15 plus years. Um, 
so that so that happened. And then, you know, there, there's obviously a lot of conversations at the high levels of the university. Uh, she'll spoke to the trustees on Sunday, um, you know, gather different opinions. But, you know, there were still more stories and there was still more pressure and calls for, uh, you know, a firing. And ultimately, that's what he, again, according to his own words, acted alone in, in making the decision to fire Pat Fitzgerald and informed him around four o'clock on Monday afternoon. And, and that was it. Um, so you certainly, you know, a lot of things to, to break down there. One thing I would add, though, is that not every school is the same. Not every school looks at athletics the same way. Not every school looks at media pressure the same way or reputational damage the same way. And this is what I can speak to a little bit more from an alum stand standpoint. Yeah. Northwestern will always care more about its reputation than its football program. So yeah. when its reputation is hit the way that it was and ethically questioned and why are you still employing this person, that's going to cut a bit deeper at Northwestern than at, you know, you can fill in the blank programs um, that maybe have a little more football history and care more about winning um, at Northwestern. They're going to react to pressure maybe differently than they are at other places, right, wrong or indifferent. That's just how it is there. You saw that with uh, the Mike Poliski athletic director situation a couple of years ago, and you certainly saw it this past weekend regarding Pat Fitzgerald. I hate asking a two-part question, but they kind of go hand in hand. So what, what have you learned about Northwestern leadership this week, and, and what are you most interested to hear from them? Yeah, interested to hear a lot of things. I'll answer your second question first. Um, you know, Certainly breaking down your, your, your last question about what changed over the course of 72 hours also, what was communicated to Pat Fitzgerald uh, before the, the release on Friday of the executive summary of, of the investigation? Was there any thought that he should have been suspended for multiple games or been more remorseful in his statement? His statement expressed disappointment that these things had happened, but did not essentially take any accountability. Uh, said, you know, I, I, I didn't know about any of this. That was the extent of it. There wasn't this is my program. I'm, I, I'm responsible for everything. I will stop at nothing to make sure this does not occur anymore in our locker room, these types of events. And, it, you know, wh why wasn't a more severe penalty on the front end? Because I, I really believe, Jeremy, if, if they had come out and said, you know what, this is serious. Yes, it was one person. Yes, you know, this may have been a disgruntled player or someone with credibility issues, but we checked it out with our attorneys and our team and found that some of this happened. And we take this really seriously, you know, even even in the, you know, and again, it's hindsight 2020, but you go back to that release and there was a lot of language in there about how serious this was. Yet you gave the head coach a two week suspension when he would have been on vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's not serious. That's not taking it seriously. So that's something I'd want to ask um, Michael Schill. Now I've, I've already forgotten your first question. Well, yeah, no, I want to go off of that point. Adam. I do wonder if they would have come out with this more seriously right? With, hey, we're suspending Pat Fitzgerald for four games. And he comes out, has a, you know, Pat Fitzgerald's good in front of a camera, good in front of a microphone and says, hey, I need to take this seriously. I want, I don't know if he survives, but Adam, I think they has a, they have a chance. Like, um, so that, that whole misstep of just trying to, I mean, they tried to sweep it under the rug, right? It, that just really backfired here. They, they did. And, and, you know, and, and again, in speaking with the whistleblower and obviously the, the talking with the current player who, had a lunch with the whistleblower and he laid out his entire plan. He was going to go to the daily, no matter what, and right. unless they had fired Fitz on Friday, that would have been satisfactory. Anything less than that. I think it would have played out similarly in terms of the details, but at least you're looking at, okay, well, yeah, these details are bad, but the investigation did not find that Fitz knew about it. And the, and the school <clears throat> uh, decided that, that a two week suspension was satisfactory uh, given what it found. So, right. I think it's a little bit different narrative than, oh, my God, he's got to get fired. They only were going to suspend him for two weeks. I mean, you know, it's and also you asked about the the administration, I think, in their handling. It's really been poor. Um, yeah. Very little transparency, not a single press conference. We're sitting here on on Thursday midday recording this. And 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 we haven't heard from Michael Schill. Uh, we haven't heard from Derek Gregg. We haven't heard from anyone who is involved in, in the decision making process. And we've only gotten a sliver of the investigative report uh, and that information. So, you know, those are things that I think are important here. This is a huge seismic decision. You know, you're, you're, you're firing, as you said, the, the face of the program, the most decorated player, arguably in team history, certainly since Otto Graham, uh, the winningest coach in team history. And then it's going to be a divorce 
with that person and all the people that love that person. That, that's huge. And I don't think that Northwestern has appropriately grasped the seriousness of the situation and how important it is to address it in public. What's next, Adam, for Pat Fitzgerald? Um, it's a great question. I, you know, my sense is Fitz will not be coaching this season. I think he's going to take time off. Uh, obviously, his son is a freshman on the Northwestern team. That 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 at least for now that complicates. You know, his his what he does. I'm sure he wants to support his son. I, I know he wants to support the team. Um, because he doesn't feel that they, you know, that, that, that essentially they did anything wrong, even though it was shown that there was some wrongdoing there. Uh, my sense is he'll, you know, consider going into media, maybe going into uh, coaching eventually, but he's a hard one to project because he turned down so many um, potential opportunities as Northwestern's head coach, whether it was other college head coaching opportunities, some NFL head coaching interest. Um, so how does he look at that now? He and his wife, Stacy, are both from the Chicago area. They have a great setup, you know, where they live. You know, do they want to uproot that to go to so he can go coach again? I mean, the guy doesn't need the money. Um, obviously, we'll see what happens with his, his, his current contract and how that plays out legally. But this is not somebody who absolutely needs a job. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, will he coach again? Where will he coach again? In what capacity? Um, that's really interesting. I don't have the answers right now. Adam, what the biggest picture of this is, I mean, this is hazing. This is some, you know, disturbing things that, that happened in this program. Don't know how prevalent it is, but like we've, we've heard of hazing. We've heard of, you know, these kind of rituals. But what is the impact of this scandal, do you think, on college football and, and college sports? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's certainly something, you, you know, that, that would have to, if I'm a head coach and I see what, what happened at Northwestern, I'm going to want to uh, talk to my team and reiterate that this is not okay. Um, most coaches look at the locker room as, as a player space, as did Pat Fitzgerald, I was told, was not somebody who was in the locker room very much. That was the player's area. And, and you know, you have to police that area, the players do, to make sure that this isn't happening and nobody's going through anything that can make them feel uncomfortable or worse. Um, I think that the hard part about this is that uh, you know, hazing has existed in sports for a really long time. Hazing has existed in organizations for a really long time, but how is it interpreted? Is it ter interpreted as rites of passage or team bonding or fun? It clearly isn't interpreted the same way by everyone. So if I'm, if I'm a, a coach, I, I'm, I'm going out of my way to ensure that it's not happening and, and that if anybody's experiencing it, I want them to come to me so that I can address it. Ultimately, uh, even if it's is, is truthful and that he didn't know about any of this, he was not good enough at policing it, clearly that this should have been reported. I, I have the original email, Jeremy, from the former player to Northwestern's compliance director. That was the way it was reported. It was not reported from anybody within the program. I also know that Northwestern, like many programs, and Illinois is probably one like this too, goes through anti-hazing seminars or, or talks or whatever multiple times a year. And according to the former player, they would go through one of them and then go right back in the locker room and, and people would be making jokes about running or, or some of these other activities. So clearly it was not being taken seriously by at least some people in the Northwestern program. And, uh, you know, as again, as the, as the leader of the program, the, the leader of the culture, uh, you know, pointing to what Michael Schill, this president said on Monday, Pat Fitzgerald paid the price for that. Yeah. He's, he's ultimately responsible. Um, Northwestern already struggling in the Big Ten here, Adam, one conference win in three of the last four years. Of course, they, they won two Big Ten West titles in there, uh, but they face a monumental challenge ahead. Uh, what does the path forward look like for Northwestern football? Right. Yeah, I think the question is, is how long will it take to kind of get on stable footing? Um, you know, this is a team that, like you said, won one game last year, was not is not projected to do very well this season. Certainly could have raised the question, independent of all of this, whether Fitz was going to survive for the 2024 season. Um, but I think there's a lot of like doom and gloom project projections when something like this happens, you know, Northwestern won't be right for 30 years or we'll never hear from them again. We both know that if you make the right coaching hire and you have the right support around that coach, you can turn it around in this sport relatively quickly. Now you're going to turn it around to the level that Northwestern was at from say 2008 to 2020 when they were, consistently winning, you know, seven to nine games, sometimes more 
five top 25 finishes, you know, two division titles. That, that's probably asking a lot, but I think you can turn it around to respectability um, and certainly play off the fact that it's still a Big Ten job. It's a Big Ten job where, you know, you don't have to win championships to keep your job. It's certainly a strong quality of life. A lot of coaches who have lived or have worked in Northwestern say it was one of their favorite stops just because of the area. Um, so th there's, those are things you have to sell. Now, there's major administrative questions. Is, is Derek Gregg going to remain the athletic director? Uh, what does the alumni support look like? Um, how fractured is the fan base and the, and the alumni base? Um, what's going to happen with Ryan Field? You know, is Ryan Field still going to be built? Uh, and that $800 million project uh, seen through, so to speak. So that's another question. So any, anyone who, who, who I think there are hard questions that any candidate or their representative will, will, should ask if they're, if they're pursuing this job. But I also think that a lot of candidates will consider this job because of some of those things I just mentioned. Yeah. And it's a big 10, it, it's a big 10 sec. So even Vanderbilt can hire people. Stanford can hire, but you know what I mean? Like th there will be candidates for this job. So wh what kind of candidates do you think they can get though, Adam? And, and what kind of candidates does Northwestern need right now? Yeah. I, and that's a great, I like that you asked it that way, Jeremy. I, mean, I, I think that Northwestern certainly needs somebody, um, you know, of, of impeccable character integrity, uh, you know, who has never had any incidents in, in his background, either personally or, with conduct of, of the team. And, um, you know, that's hard. Uh, you know, some of these coaches have coached a long time and not everyone's always going to be happy with them. And, you know, anyone can make allegations. I mean, we've, we saw that with the Northwestern situation. So uh, I, think that, I think that's important. I mean, you know, the, 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 will they look at people with ties to the university, given how long Fitz was there and how long some of these allegations supposedly occurred? Um, you know, you look at someone like Mike Kafka, who's an absolute rising star, the New York Giants offensive coordinator, who's a star quarterback at Northwestern in 2009. He, he coached under Pat Fitzgerald as a young guy before he went to the NFL. You know, if you could get him, I think a lot of Northwestern people would be thrilled. But does that is the optics of it questionable? Because, you know, was Mike Kafka involved in this stuff when he was playing? We don't know. Um, or do you look at I, I think if I were uh, Northwestern, I certainly would look at head coaching experience and I would look at people who have been at similar schools and I would look at someone who might want to see this as their final stop and two names to me come to mind in that category one is Dave Clawson at Wake Forest and the other is Willie Fritz at Tulane both of those are both are private schools both have limited recruiting bases both are academically oriented in nature and both of those coaches have had great success at, at some tough programs. You know, Dave was at Bowling Green, Willie Fritz was at Georgia Southern and, and various programs in and around Kansas. I mean, you know, they, they, they understand tough jobs and this is going to be a tough job and both are older. I, I, I would, I would go after guys like that. I mean, there's obviously other people you could consider, but um, I, I do think the fact you're know, bringing in somebody who, who, who has built programs, who can, has overcome some obstacles and also has, some things in their background that make them maybe a little unique schematically. The thing I like about Dave Clawson as a Northwestern candidate is that Wake Forest runs a different type of offense. It's, 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 it's unique if you watch it and it gives them an edge when, when maybe they don't have the talent edge over their opponents. And I think that's something that Northwestern is certainly going to need going forward because we don't know how they're going to build their roster, at least for a little while. So those are some of the things that I would look at, look at, but I think above all, I mean, you've obviously been damaged, as Michael Schill said in his statement, the university, the program has been damaged. You can't afford further embarrassment. And so I think the vetting of somebody's background, how they've handled locker rooms and conduct incidents, all these coaches have, have seen something go on. How, I think that's going to be an important part of the interview process. Adam, uh, before I ask you one final question, I want to ask you something else about the Big Ten. Uh, Big Ten Media Day is right around the corner, and obviously this is going to be a big storyline there. Uh, that people are going to focus on. But uh, Tony Petiti is is the new Big Ten commissioner. Just what have been your impressions so far uh, of Tony Petiti since he's taken this job? You know, pretty good. Uh, you know, it's been early. I only, I only had the chance to visit with Tony um, the day he was introduced at the Big Ten headquarters. But, um, I, I you know, I like his, his demeanor. Uh, I think he's a guy that obviously is sharp and has worked in different areas of, of, of sports. But, um, also seems to be someone who will listen and communicate. You know, that was a problem that occurred uh, in various levels under Kevin Warren's leadership is that there wasn't a strong enough communication between him and the athletic directors and the coaches. And, 
and some other constituents around the Big Ten. So I think from talking to some people around the league, they, they seem happy with Tony. Um, you know, Tony's obviously got uh, a lot of you know items to work on and you're know, finishing the media deal and um, and looking ahead to, you know, whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's a big time job, but, you know, so far in his tenure, again, with very limited time around him, but talking to uh, people who know him, I think he, he seemed like a good choice. Somebody who clearly I didn't know a whole lot about. I don't think you did either. But um, I think because he's <clears throat> he's worked in the media world and he's also been in leadership with MLB, um, I think he was equipped to handle this job pretty well. Yeah, Josh Whitman is, is raved about him so far. Um, Adam, I, I know the Medill School of Journalism. Um, we both went to schools of journalism. Um, it's kind of a remor- reminder of how important student journalism is. Um, and it, it was... Uh, I don't know. You know, the media can, can be criticized and, and fairly and, and some unfairly, but uh, that was that was impressive by those student journalists this week. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And Ooh. obviously, I went to I, I went to I was at the Daily Northwestern in in, in school, alumni uh, alum of that of that um, newspaper, a very proud alum of that newspaper, um, and certainly proud of, of of the work that they were able to do because you know this story was essentially over on Friday and it changed on Saturday. Um, you know, clearly the whistleblower's intent was always to go to the daily, but credit to them for being the source that he wanted to go to. And then they took it from there and put it into a story that, that obviously changed the, the, the spectrum here. Um, and, 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 and obviously, uh, uh, you know, got things moving towards the, the eventual dismissal of Pat Fitzgerald. I, you know, as you know, Jeremy, we're not in this to fire people. We're in this to, right. to tell the truth and inform the public and inform the fans and, and that's what they ultimately did in that in that story, um, and and certainly deserve the credit that they're getting. Yeah, no, uh, some these stories aren't always fun to cover, but it's your job. Um, so I, I thought they did, you know, a job of getting information to the public that the public didn't know, and obviously it changed everything and held truth to power. But uh, Adam, you've done a great job in this story. Uh, thank you for joining us. I know it's been a busy time, man. 